This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Witte, who is the Jonas Robisher Professor of Law, the Alonzo L. McDonald Distinguished Professor and Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory Law School uh, at Emory University. He is the 2011 Jefferson Lecturer on the Berkeley campus. John? Welcome to our program. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Where, where did you go to uh, college, and what, what was your major in? I followed the, the natural path for a Dutch immigrant boy, which was to go to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, it was the college of the Christian Reformed Church, of which I was a member. Um, I was there. My world opened up rapidly when I got there. That was a big city. That was a big uh, intellectual environment, and I studied biology, history, and philosophy. I simply couldn't settle on one and so I was a pre-med, a pre-law, and a pre-graduate uh, school student. Uh, and it was a small enough college where you could do all three without and, being too much of a fool. And, and what, what helped you sort that out? I mean, a lot of p different paths that you could have taken. I was inspired by, by teachers in all three of those fields. And I ultimately did the, the MCAT, the LSAT, and the GRE and applied for law school, medical school, and graduate school. Got, in, <laughs> got into all three and uh, then couldn't decide. And what ultimately helped me decide was I wrote to this wonderful professor at Harvard Law School called Harold J. Berman, whose work I had read a great deal in my undergraduate days. He had been writing on issues of Soviet law, but also law and religion in Western history. And I found his work deeply uh, satisfying intellectually. And I just took, uh, as a 21-year-old punk at a Calvin College, the whim of writing him and asking him for his advice. And he gave me a long two-page letter back. And the core of his advice was, come study with me and we can work together on issues of law and religion in Western history. That was the key for me, and I went to sit at his feet. And so it was Harvard Law School, and there, what was, was there a, a kind of a, a, a focus that immediately track, attracted you? This, this kind of, obviously, you ended up with law and religion as a, as a, as a very great interest. Yeah, I spent, um, uh, all law students have their first year prescribed, and uh, during that first year of law school courses, I spent 40 hours of work working with, Ber working with Berman. Uh, it was a little grueling, uh, but it was a wonderful opportunity to be released into the treasure room of the Harvard Law Library and read all these fabulous tracts in the 14th to the 18th century, focusing on different aspects of law and religion in Western history. Uh, throughout my second and third year, I continued to work with Berman. I took elective courses in the grad school, the divinity school, as well as the law school. Um, you don't specialize in law school, but I, I, I tended to focus on courses that looked at issues of, of legal history, uh, legal philosophy, interdisciplinary approaches to law, which were just beginning to bubble at Harvard Law School at the time with critical legal studies especially. Uh, and I had a chance to just uh, uh, smell the flowers in a number of different fields and convince myself that the stuff I was doing avocationally as a research assistant with Berman was really front and center of what I wanted to do professionally. And, and, and the, the important uh, new uh, uh, path here is really history and the history of the law, yeah, not just being a lawyer. Not just being a lawyer. I, I couldn't see myself as being a conventional lawyer and practicing in public or private or public interest work. I would do that if it was necessary for five or ten years to cultivate a traditional specialty and then hold that out alongside my passionate interest in law and religion and legal history. Uh, but I really didn't see myself uh, actually practicing law. What I wanted to do was to be a legal scholar. And one of the things that Professor Berman pushed me to do uh, was to write and to write early. He co-authored a couple of articles with me while I was a law student and then really turned me loose and pushed me hard to uh, get into writing myself. And so I followed none of the conventional routes. I didn't do law review. I didn't do moot court. I didn't do federal clerkships. I just worked with Berman 40 hours a week. And I wrote up a storm while I was a law student. And that got me started rather quickly as a law professor. And, and uh, as, as you talk about your background, there seems to be an interesting dynamic between a 
what you're calling a provincial background within a kind of a closed community, but really opening up to a cosmopolitan world and, and, and then focusing on this interface between the law and religion, which, which, which is key to that, uh, that interface. Yeah, it was really interesting to, walk, to move from this tiny cultural uh, cocoon in St. Catharines, Ontario, to what I consider to be the big city of Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then to go from there to Harvard Law School, where, the, where in many ways you had a, a platform to look at the world and to have a chance to interact with fellow students from all different walks of life and all different parts of the world, uh, to be able to interact with ideas uh, in the Western tradition, but also well beyond the Western tradition, uh, to have a chance to look both historically uh, and uh, along very, very wide public policy grids at some of the fundamental questions of faith, of freedom, of family, and other things that, that captivated me, uh, convinced me that, that the binocular of law and religion that Berman was giving me the opportunity to look through and to think about how these two great universal solvents of human living have worked historically, how they work today, how in many ways they provide the biggest challenges for us historically and today. That was a captivating way to think about the world anew. And it was an unpopular way of thinking about the world in the 1980s when I was a law student. People didn't really think about religion as a category of legal study. Uh, pe most people still were working under the Enlightenment assumption that uh, religion was superstition, uh, it was the opiate of the masses, it was something that would, would happily die a, a, uh, uh, a quiet death uh, as scientific rationalism uh, took over and technology would replace uh, the, uh, the priesthood uh, as the leaders of our society and culture. And at the time, when making an argument to say that religion actually is an important source of Western law, that religious dimensions of law are actually important to take into account that religious legal systems are really part of our cultural identity and civilization and we have to take them seriously. That at the time was controversial, but I felt in part by reason of my own uh, upbringing in a conservative Christian community uh, and in part by looking in anal by analogy into Jewish and Muslim communities could see this was something that we needed to do and I thought Berman uh, was remarkably prescient and courageous at the time to be pressing this as a, a fundamental part of legal education, so and happily we were vindicated in that yeah. over time. So, so you, you, you were coming uh, uh, to your education just at a time when the, there was intellectual ferment. Let's, let's talk a little about that because the, 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 the reigning notion had been, well, law is an isolated uh, uh, set of studies. Yeah. Uh, and that, that it's really, we, to, you quote Holmes in one of your articles, it's, it's really from experience that we get the law. It, it's not from uh, um, natural law or from, from any other sectors of society. Yeah, a lot, the legal education from the 1920s to the 1970s, in North America at least, uh, was intensely positivistic in the sense of uh, law is really its own science. It's an autonomous science. Uh, what we're looking for is the instruments, the, the techniques of law, uh, and how law emerges, uh, to what extent it's influenced by or has influence on other dimensions of life, uh, to what extent we want to take into account any other institutions besides the state in the operation of law. We're all considered to be uh, taboo subjects. In the late 1960s and 70s, there was the rise of interdisciplinary legal study. Some of that on the back of legal realism, that it challenged this notion of autonomous legal reasoning, but a lot of it with the, the rise of recognizing that holistic understandings of knowledge had to also apply to law. That law properly had to be understood in concert in conversation with other disciplines. And we were just beginning to see interdisciplinary legal study emerging. Law and economics was the first one, law and politics a second, law and literature a third. These were suddenly new areas of, of interdisciplinary discourse that were beginning to be accepted into legal education and began to fracture the traditional legal positivism paradigm. Uh, the law and religion movement that Berman and others were starting in the 1970s built on the momentum of that interdisciplinary legal studies movement altogether. And, and what was going on in society in your mind that accounts for this change of thinking? Because one always wonders uh, what makes for intellectual uh, ferment for, for new paradigms, new ways of looking at things? Yeah, it's a good political scientist question, of course. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, I think one was, was simply the exhaustion uh, of the legal positivist paradigm as, as just methodologically impossible to maintain, and the recognition that these doctrines don't just sit, 
they're not just um, isolated icons. They have to really be thought about in context. Part of it was the Marxist critique of law uh, that began to challenge some of the economic and sociological assumptions that were being made uh, in legislation and litigation. Some of it was a kind of new approach of, of psychologists and anthropologists who began to look at law uh, as very much part of, of a cultural and, and, and civilizational fabric. Uh, part of it was feminist critiques of law that began to challenge a lot of the patriarchal assumptions that were explicit or latent in, in legal institutions. Uh, and I think part of it was simply the new uh, holism that was beginning to emerge in epistemology, where people were beginning to say, look, we, in order to understand life, in order to stand, understand a big institution like law or religion or the economy or um, things of comparable heft, uh, we really needed to have a, a kaleidoscopic methodology. Uh, and I think all of those converged together in, in higher legal education to, to force people to try to develop new paradigms. And interdisciplinary legal study was the beneficiary of that uh, in the 1970s and 80s. What, what is the, the skill set involved in the kind of work that you do? Uh, obviously, a, a knowledge of the law but this, you clearly come to the profession at a time when interdisciplinary skills uh, are very important. And it, it would also seem that comparative skills uh, are very important. It's not just what's happening in Christianity or Judaism, but, but also Islam. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, there's no, you have to remember interdisciplinary legal study is about legal study. And first and foremost, uh, we're, what we're doing for um, people coming through a law and religion focus is to prepare them to be lawyers. In any walk of life, in any profession or any institutional structure, they've got to learn the basic black letter rules and tools of contracts and torts and property and constitutional law. They have to learn the basic methods and matters of legal science, methods of reasoning, methods of of evidence collecting, methods of building and breaking down arguments. They have to understand that they're part of a long tradition and understand what precedent means and how to apply it. There's no substitute for that in any interdisciplinary legal approach that, that betrays those fundamentals of the profession, really in many ways betrays itself over time. So what we do is we add a dimension to education that says that religion has been an important historical source for many of our legal ideas, for better or for worse. Um, that religion is a dimension of life that has to be taken into account when you look at uh, how a legal institution or system as a whole operates, and that religious communities themselves uh, have legal systems, halakha within Judaism, sharia within uh, Islam, uh, canon law and ecclesiastical discipline within Christianity, and that these are massive nonprofit organizations global in their, in their sweep uh, that have internal mechanisms of law that have to be understood and that we have to understand the relationship between them and state law. We have to understand the religious freedom claims that those individuals and groups make on the strength of their religious convictions and religious institutional apparatus. And we have to understand how to broker uh, the inevitable tensions one has between different religious communities, understandings of law, or their own particular religious legal system with each other and with the state. And then I think finally, I think the real question is, is, is trying to sensitize people to uh, the reality that um, law and religion is simply one uh, example of interdisciplinary legal study. That in, uh, to do this right, like to do legal education in general right, you have to have very strong peripheral vision. You have to understand law and economics. You have to understand law and sociology, law and politics, law and literature. The best lawyer who's trained is always trained with at least to have very, very powerful peripheral vision. That even if he or she is specialized in a given area of law, like law and religion, you have to be sensitive to and have enough peripheral vision to understand what's there on the outside of your discipline. Law is a big universal solvent of human living. Law is a huge science that has to be mastered. And even if you specialize, you've got to have enough sense of when you don't know. Mm -hmm. you, you refer at, at one point in one of your essays to kind of a, a, bina a binocular vision uh, when it comes to understanding the interface be between law uh, and religion. Talk about that because the, the trajectory in the past was to focus on one or to focus yeah. on the other. So part of it, it's just a, a, a clever image to try to get people to recognize that when you're looking at, especially an historical phenomenon or a movement, uh, 
say, the 16th century Protestant Reformation. You can't just look at that through theology or through doctrine or through liturgy. And you can't just look at that as the time of the reception of Roman law or the uh, transformation of the Roman Empire, uh, the, the uh, Holy Roman Empire, uh, or the rise of, of uh, the legal profession. In many ways, what, you want, what you're interested in is taking a binocular vision of that movement, of that period, and saying, how do these two feed each other? In many ways, it's a species of the question you asked me a few minutes ago. What caused the change in the 1970s and 80s toward interdisciplinary legal study? This is a, 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 a spin on that question, which is, to what extent, if you put law and theology together, if you look at this through the lenses of both the professional legal historian and the professional church historian, what do you see in the 16th century uh, that's distinctive and how do they feed each other? It's that image that I, I acquired initially as an historian that I'm trying now to train uh, on modern questions, questions of family, for example, family being a, a both a legal and a spiritual institution, issues of education, which in many ways has both religious uh, and secular dimensions, issues of charity and the like. So in many ways, it's an, an attempt to say, uh, rather than simply training one methodology, uh, one set of institutional concerns, one set of professional aspirations on uh, a given topic or theme, uh, let's try to bring the two together into an interesting widening of the perspective that's offered by that. It is, it, uh, I'm curious, in, in terms of being a historian of a faith, uh, and if one actually believes in the faith. What, what is that tension like? Because the law and history is, is finding the truth by you know, rigorous standards and, and searching for ob objectivity. But on the other hand, a, a person of faith uh, is a believer. But, but somehow I get the sense from your work that this, that this tension really is, is uh, helpful in probing what happened in the religion and understanding the dynamic by which uh, this is brought into the legal system. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question, and we yeah. could be here a little while. <laughs> um, first of all, you know, objective historiography is, is a wonderful thing to do in the classroom, but it's not really easy to do in practice. So people bring their blinders, people bring their prejudices and preferences, and, and that's simply part of, of, of the epistemology of being an historian. Uh, secondly, I would say I'm not an historian of, of a particular Christian community or a particular tr uh, tradition of thought. I'm really an historian of the West. I happen to study um, the, f the, st the two modern, the two millennia of the, mo of the common era, uh, sometimes dipping into ancient Greek and Hebrew and, and uh, Roman texts. Um, and increasingly, as I've, I've gotten a bit older, uh, trying to look beyond the West for analogy for um, competing perspectives for different ways of thinking about things. Um, I'm interested in, in this in part as a person of religious faith uh, who, who wants to find a way of, of, of uh, reconstructing some of the wisdom of, tr of my particular tradition of Christianity uh, and making it applicable to a modern pluralistic world where there is no longer an assumption of a Christian magistrate, when there's no longer an assumption of uh, an established religion uh, and when there's intense pluralism and people's argument from faith or from a canon or from a tradition uh, is simply the start rather than the end of the conversation that in many ways developing the rational logic to make the, this wisdom of the tradition applicable and useful to broader pluralistic society. So part of my exercise is that. Part of my exercise is that of an historian to say, uh, historian of law, excuse me, to say uh, I'm interested in seeing what precedent is useful and what precedent needs to be discarded. Yaroslav Pelikan, the great uh, Yale uh, church historian, now at last, the last of blessed memory, has this notion of tradition is the living faith of the dead, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of traditions being something that grows, understanding where we came from, understanding where we're going, and trying to find the, the mechanisms, the methodologies, the responsible ways uh, of moving the growing end of the tradition to accommodate new realities, to purge uh, injustices of the past. Um, so both of those exercises are going on simultaneously in my mind. I don't pretend that I'm objective, but what's interesting to me personally as I walked through these last 25 years is that there's a little boy in St. Catharines, Ontario in a very, very small Christian cocoon uh, of the Dutch Calvinist variety in particular, kind of having the privilege uh, to grow in humility as you look across the world, you look at all these fabulous ideas and institutions that are out there, to see all these different faith communities and how they operate. And 
it reminds me, and I'll stop at this, reminds me of, of this wonderful adage that Martin Marty, the great uh, uh, church historian at, at University of Chicago has, playing with this movie theme. It takes a thief to catch a thief. And his flip on that is it takes a, piece, a person of deep religious conviction to appreciate the deep religious conviction of another. You learn by analogy, and you appreciate, tolerate, respect the rights of, and support the, the existence of the other, just because by analogy you can see what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that's kind of been what in, what's interesting for me as I've kind of toured Judaism, Islam, and dabbled a bit in other faith traditions and their influence upon uh, law and culture. Uh, you, you, one of the conclusions that, that uh, I think you've come to as, as I read some of your essays is really that there is a lot of uh, commonalities in the law and in religion, that these are two domains that, that in, in some sense uh, mirror each other. There are a lot of similarities that have evolved over time. Yeah, I mean, we share certain concepts. I mean, uh, covenant and contract, justice and righteousness. Uh, we share certain institutions, mm, take marriage, take education, take charity. Uh, we, ch we share uh, a number of methods. I mean, how to parse the text, how to build a tradition, how to create a canon, how to, how to reason uh, responsibly from, from, from text and tradition to modern pres prescription or, or pre principle. Um, we share a, a lot of institutional structures. I mean, religious communities are organized as corporate entities in many ways uh, and have government structures that sometimes are analogous to that which prevails in the state. Historically, uh, sometimes these overlap, they were the same. Uh, today, they're often differentiated. And so what I'm interested in is, is kind of looking at that creative interplay. And, and then taking again the binocular angle, in many ways when we're talking about an agreement that we have together, from a religious side it's a covenant, from a uh, legal side it's a contract, and what's interesting is the convergence between those two or the overlapping consensus and the creative tension between these two. Uh, we, we talk about uh, redemption and rehabilitation uh, as, as ways of moving beyond a, a point of conflict and, and coming back into community. Well, from a religious side, this has some really interesting liturgical and other institutional and psychological elements. On the legal side, there's a, a lot of methodology in that uh, and institutional responsibility that follows. So part of what I'm interested in is, is to look at those, um, uh, those binaries, uh, especially where there's creative tension. Uh, I would be curious, because you, you seem to be well positioned to, to give us some insights on this. What, what is creativity uh, look like in the law, and what does creativity look like in, in religion itself, the practice of religion, and or, or, or there, can they be compared at all? That's interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, well, we're both working out of traditions. Uh, we both we both presuppose precedent, and we all we all make we both make um, changes only um, when we overcome the, null the presumption of the null hypothesis. There has to be strong argument to make change. So creativity is in part a, a, a creature of what we're, what we're f faced with in a society. Law works, theology works, or religious communities work uh, with the contingencies of, of, of where they live. Um, I'd say secondly, I mean, there's a inspiration works in both, in both these traditions in different ways. I mean, religious communities talk about divine inspiration or inspiration from the heart. Uh, but legal communities talk the same way. I mean, we have transcendent ideals. We have transcendent values that we seek to, to aspire to. I mean, what is liberty? What is, you know, due process of law? What are the, some of these fundamentals that we take for granted? These are transcendent ideals that inspire certain change over time and, and induce creative change. I think third, we also um, sometimes face com common calamities. Uh, the Holocaust, uh, World War, uh, a tsunami. Um, you know, the, 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 the blight of terrorism, uh, a, a nuclear holocaust, uh, all of which face us today. And those demand uh, sometimes serious uh, institutional and intellectual changes in our particular communities, and we, we sometimes will work together uh, as religious and political communities to respond to those. It's not a good answer. It's a, it's a question I'm going to have to ponder. Uh, no, it, it was more than satisfactory. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I know that in your work, the, you, you've done a lot of work on looking at the way uh, religion 
impacted the law, changed the law, that, that it was the religious individuals and groups who, in practicing their religion, sought freedom, for, sought the right to speak, sought the right to pray, to association, and, and sort of built the foundation that, that a, a lot of what we understand as the, the, the uh, Western uh, human rights, the, that definition, came about. Talk a little about that, because that, that interface really becomes important in, in understanding how the law emerged and how it should relate to other religions. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's uh, a hard question of, of uh, that's a shifting, uh, you're, you're moving into a shifting field of, of the history of human rights. I mean, our schoolboy and schoolgirl logic in textbooks always taught us that human rights are a product of the Enlightenment. Uh, they are the final celebration of, of uh, reason over religion, the celebration of the individual over community, the celebration of the sovereignty of the individual over the sovereignty of God. And we've now finally uh, broken the shackles of religious establishment and created human rights for all. And that's a, a wonderful uh, schoolboy logic that, that many of us grew up with. Uh, the, tr the reality is that historically it's complete nonsense. Um, it's an interesting anecdote, but an important one, to say that by 1650, uh, 1650, 150 years before the Bill of Rights was passed, every one of the rights set forth in the Bill of Rights had already been defined, defended, and died for by Protestants and by Catholics. Uh, forged out of, out of great struggle, oftentimes responses to uh, the ardor of um, persecution, of pogroms, of, of religious warfare, uh, but a recognition over time through cruel experience that there are certain features of human nature, certain features that we share uh, with all brothers and sisters on this earth that really have to be respected by the state. Um, now what that anecdote tries to illustrate is that Rights talk is not uh, something that is uh, a creature of the Enlightenment, number one. Uh, rights talk is also not something which is a creature of the West or a, a, cre a creature of, of uh, Western Christianity. In many, way, in many ways, rights are uh, fundamental goods of human nature, uh, fundamental gifts that we've all been given, uh, that have evolved over time or been imbued in us through a creator or through a creative process, depending on how you want to deal with human anthropology. And that the West, sometimes through cr hard and cruel experience, began to discover these rights of human nature uh, and began to think about how to implement them in serious ways. And oftentimes were forced to implement them and fight for them in serious ways when they were fundamentally betrayed by tyranny, by warfare, uh, by persecution, by pogrom. And that we can find, if you look at the history of the West, we can find rights talk uh, already in the Hebrew Bible, in some of the early Roman law texts, in medieval canon law, in early modern civil law and, and, and common law. Uh, and in many ways, the Enlightenment is living off of the capital uh, of the intellectual discovery and institutional implementation of rights uh, that the West uh, had, through long and hard process, uh, come to discover. And why that's important for discussion of universal human rights in the 20th and 21st century is that um, what human rights instruments today become for other communities are simply mirrors in which they can reflect upon their own civilization and cultural and religious experience, and invitations for them to go back to uh, their texts, their canons, their original ideas, their great prophets, some of them slaughtered for their courageous advocacy, and to begin to see in their own religious traditions and civilizational uh, patterns uh, what are the teachings and practices, norms and habits that are most conducive to, to what we in the West now in the 20th century have called human rights? And the interesting thing that's going on, and one of your prior guests, my uh, dear friend and colleague Abduan Naim, uh, calls a hermeneutic of human rights that's beginning to emerge in different parts of the world with Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, even traditional communities beginning to use uh, this human rights as mirror image to begin to look back at their traditions to reclaim their own voices in the human rights discussions and then to criticize some of the formulations of human rights that we have as purported universal statements after World War II and to begin to make particular claims to their unique understandings of what human nature demands and needs uh, in the 21st century. So, so building this edifice of 
of a, a lawful society where religion is respected it involves hard work. Uh, it, it's a navigation uh, that requires both the law and society to change on the one hand, but also religions, uh, you're, you're suggesting, to think about their own history and their own set of values in light of, of what you call the mirror of, of human yeah. rights. Hard work. It is hard work and cruel work sometimes, and oftentimes is induced or catalyzed uh, by uh, the sudden and traumatic absence or betrayal of fundamental rights. I mean, what happens when you blow up 100,000 people? What happens when you see uh, tens of thousands of people dying from famine or, or treatable disease when there's, there's food rotting in the storage sheds? Uh, what happens when you have massive atrocities, alas, as we've seen in Chile and, and Southeast Asia, uh, in Rwanda, Burundi, and Chechetni, and elsewhere? Well, there we're beginning to see um, we, we viscerally react against that in part because it violates our very human nature to see brothers and sisters in different parts of the world uh, so trammeled in their human existence. And what it induces and the hard work it causes is to get the local communities to begin to process, painful as it is, uh, to claim um, what are the grounds on which we can properly treat the other and what are on those grounds the violations that have to be, um, what, what, are the, what are the violations that, that have to be both advertised, uh, indicted, and then ultimately pursued for remedy. Um, and I, I think what's happening, interestingly, in different parts of the world today, see the democratic revolutions in, in the Mediterranean basin, in North Africa, all the way out to uh, Libya, Yemen, and elsewhere, uh, from Libya you know, to Yemen and, and Iran and elsewhere, is that uh, each of these communities is going through this hard experience now through revolutionary fervor. Some of them are prepared, some of them are not prepared to accept the human rights that they're advocating. Uh, what's important, uh, especially for our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world, is to recognize that the West did not create rights. Western Christian paths to discovering rights are not translatable into other religious communities. And Western formulations, constitutional formulations of rights, are not exportable uh, entities that simply can be put in place in these communities as the be-all and end-all. Every community has to discover for itself. Every religious tradition has to discover for itself the resources it has to put in place the rights that ultimately are going to respect uh, the fundamentals of human nature. And that's going to be a creaky, a painful, uh, an arduous, sometimes a centuries-long process as it was in the West. Uh, but every community, I think, eventually will get there. And, and w w help us understand more what this work involves. In, in a way, in, in a particular religion, it, 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 is, it, it seems to be uh, in part uh, a struggle over power. Who will define what our tradition is? Uh, which texts will we look to? What is the interpretation of those texts? So, so th th this is kind of the, the work that takes time, it takes argument, and uh, it takes persuasion, but it can also be a bloody conflict with any, within any particular religion. Sure, um, and you, you put your finger right on the hardest part at the beginning, which is the power. Uh, those who hold the power are not interested in changing uh, institutional structures that have propped them up in that power. And oftentimes it takes uh, not just persuasion, but, but, but serious uh, pressure and sometimes revolutionary fervor uh, and outright revolution and warfare to remove power brokers that stand in the way of the realization of rights. Whether they're religious or political or cultural tribal leaders, uh, these folk are not going to give up easily. And a mere argument uh, out of uh, John Locke's two treatises on government is not going to convince them. And a mere argument to say, but it's going to be good for your people uh, and think of what's going to happen to them once you give them their full human rights is not going to work either. It takes violence, unfortunately. Violence is a necessary, uh, at least an, e an essential and sometimes a necessary condition uh, for the move toward democratic government uh, and human rights uh, vindication on the ground. Uh, and the one uh, virtue we have in the 21st century globalized world with its transparent media uh, is that it's not so easy uh, 
uh, for tyrants to con continue to sit uh, without accountability to the world. And so one of the things that human rights does in international diplomacy, and forgive me for treading on your own uh, area of expertise, um, it, it mobilizes shame. Uh, it allows for diplomatic pressure. It allows for sanctions and other kinds of pressure that don't rise to the level of violence, but nonetheless make it very uncomfortable for tyrants to sit comfortably uh, in their seats, uh, trammeling the rights of the people under their authority. Um, it also provides ballast um, and, and enthusiasm for uh, those that would advocate ideally by peaceable means, but oftentimes necessarily by uh, tense and sometimes violent means, uh, to begin to prop uh, off that tyrant off of his throne and to put in place a more responsible government that's consistent with the rights of the people. But these are, this is hard work, and in religious communities especially, uh, the mechanisms for change, especially in hierarchical communities, uh, just aren't easily there. I mean, it takes reformations. Uh, reformations have occurred in the history of Christianity uh, since the third and fourth century. It's not just a Protestant Reformation. Reform movements have been a perennial part uh, of Christian identity in the West, and some of them have turned into violence. Some of them have, have resulted in huge um, dislocation of people and, and deprivation of property and loss of life. Um, that's part of the process, and unfortunately, our Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, and other friends are, are experiencing the same things around the world now. What, what is the responsibility uh, on the other side? That is, looking at it from the perspective of the human rights advocates, the, 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 the people who sort of embody you know, all of the, the rights that we've achieved. So in, in this interplay between religion you know, and, and uh, the Western notion of rights. What, what is the responsibility of those individuals and the law that they represent to be sensitive to what's going on in these uh, uh, religious communities and to be respectful uh, of where those religious communities are even as we would desire change on their part to, to come closer to the, to the mirror of human rights yeah. values? Well, there, there are two, two pieces to that. One is, you know, what obligation befalls the uh, democratic human rights revolutionary in the first place, regardless of the object of his or its or their uh, or, their, or her um, advocacy? And I, I would say there we have, I think, Martin Luther King is a shining example uh, who, who always insisted that the first way to advocate for human rights is to live them yourself and not to violate the human rights of the other, including the tyrant on the throne, uh, in the name of some cause that, that ultimately betrays the very thing that you're doing. You've got to respect basic rights of other people, including, uh, including the enemy, including the other uh, whom you're trying to displace. So I think that's a lesson that's really powerful for human rights advocates uh, in general uh, as they press for democratic revolution to try to do this uh, with as much um, uh, deference to the universal claims that they themselves are trying to make in the particular moment of those, the people that they're going after. I would say especially with respect to human rights advocates looking at religious communities. Uh, I think we have to avoid um, the um, the easy assumptions of the 1950s through 70s, uh, where it was assumed that religion is irrational, uh, that religious communities are, are simply bastions of power, uh, that religious communities themselves are, are, are simply ir are incapable uh, of being um, reasoned with on human rights terms, uh, and come to realize that human rights communities historically, and human rights communities potentially still today, and in some places in reality still today, are bastions of human rights. They're zones of liberty that provide opportunity for revolutionaries. They provide many of the basic, what we call second generation rights of education and health care and artistic opportunities and more. Uh, and that religious communities are allies, uh, not enemies in the struggle for human rights. They'll be hardened, um, sometimes intractable religious leaders out there periodically whom one will encounter. Uh, some of them will betray the, the caricature that we have of religion in general. But I think folk have to recognize that if you can find ways of appealing to these religious communities in and on their very own terms, find ways of making this human rights mirror something that they're forced to reflect on, 
your own canon says, your own tradition teaches, your own prophets have articulated, your own uh, great traditional heroes have, have spoken to these issues in, in this particular way, and to allow those folk to be betrayed by their own religious traditions and, and teachings rather than simply having human rights imposed on them from outside. I think that is, in many ways, the, the strongest uh, uh, advocacy uh, and most effective um, revolutionary move that uh, human rights advocates can make. Let's look at a case in point, and that is the, the, the growing number of Muslim communities in the West. The, the question is raised, well, to what extent should Western courts uh, recognize Sharia uh, and court proceedings of, 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 of Muslim courts and so on? So, so what, give us a, a sense of, of how you see this tension evolving over time in a, in a way where there is appropriate adjustment on both sides uh, for bringing uh, these communities, you know, uh, together. Yeah, this is really uh, the, the issue just on the, over the horizon of the frontier of, of, of family law, of religious freedom, of human rights, and of, of uh, the place of Islam in, in Western societies. Uh, the question is, is to what extent can faith-based family laws, Sharia courts, uh, be given jurisdiction or power over the marriage and family lives of their voluntary faithful? Uh, it's an issue that's getting pressed very, very firmly in Western Europe and the United Kingdom. Um, it's being pressed uh, um, with a little less alacrity in Canada. It's just around the corner here in the United States. Think of Oklahoma last year just passing a law that says, mm, no Sharia, thank you here. Nine states have that under advisement. People are seeing this as the big issue. So here's the question. Um, marriage and family laws transformed over the last 50 or 60 years in the United States, uh, in part through new understandings of sexual liberty, personal autonomy, privacy, um, and the institutional requirements for what marriage is or what a proper domestic relationship is uh, have dramatically changed uh, and been thinned compared to their traditional form. And now marriage increasingly is a private bilateral contract to be formed, maintained, and dissolved as the parties see fit. Sexual relationships outside of marriage are perfectly permissible as long as they're voluntary and the parties are consenting adults. Uh, and the traditional range of sex crimes that are out there, uh, abortion, contraception, adultery, and the like, are increasingly becoming private offenses at best that are not enforced, in part because of dead letter or constitutional change um, that's emerged. Muslims don't like these changes, for the most part, in their Western host, new Western host homes, uh, and they want out. They want to be free from this marriage and family law system that now obtains in many Western democracies, including the United States, and they want to become a law unto themselves. And their argument increasingly is to say, we would like to have our voluntary faithful opt out of the state law and into the law of our own religious community. And we would rather have our imams and our Sharia tribunals and our, our religious leadership in our community govern our questions of marriage, family, sexuality, child custody, inheritance, and the like, uh, rather than have these questions be dealt with by the state. And if we have uh, our voluntary faithful who accept our jurisdiction over marriage, we don't want any one of them appealing to the state when we judge against their interest and they all of a sudden uh, seek relief from a local state or from a federal court. And the, their argument is, say, we'd, we'd like to have that autonomy because actually Jews have that. They have their halakha, they have their bet din. Christians have that. They have their ecclesiastical courts that deal with marriage and family questions, and we want to have that too. Uh, and if we don't like those two examples, native peoples, uh, traditional tribes, they have their tribal rulers, they have their ancestral laws, and they operate their own legal systems. And we want that autonomy as a matter of religious freedom, as a matter of personal autonomy, as a matter of, of basic individual rights, equal protection, due process of law, uh, and as a matter of simple cultural coexistence or multiculturalism as the political. Um, the argument they're pressing uh, is an argument that so far has gotten nowhere in, in North America. Uh, but that argument is going to be increasingly in the courts and in the culture wars uh, over the next 20 or 30 years as Muslim communities grow, uh, as 
state laws of, of marriage and family get thinner and thinner as different forms of marriage or marital pluralism de facto or de jure are in place. We have domestic partnership arrangements, we have civil unions, we have covenant marriage in a few states, uh, we have traditional heterosexual monogamous marriage, um, we have uh, same-sex marriage. Why can't we have in the off-the-rack models that the state holds out religious marriage? That a party can simply take that bundle of rights and privileges that the state puts in place and use those for their system. That issue is going to be pushed uh, over the next 20 or 30 years, and I think we're going to have to develop resources to start dealing with it responsibly. One of the the things that uh, comes out in in your essays uh, and and also in our conversation here is this. Uh, it, the separation of religion and the law in in the in the past uh, led to a, a kind of a, a general uh, misunderstanding or a lack of appreciation of the dignity of the other, basically. And so and uh, and and because when when one looks at the issues, let's say in the United States, where uh, religion seems to be a factor, it's issues of of gay marriage, its issue of, of abortion. Uh, it, I think it originally started in the question of busing uh, in, in religious schools. So, so the, the, the interesting problem here is how do we restore uh, a sense of the other and their dignity and where they're coming from as we prepare to argue about which direction the law should go in the general society. And, and this then also applies in the international context where we, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's even harder to appreciate what Hindus or Muslims or whatever might want because of their tradition. Yeah, well that's a, again, a set of hard questions yeah. and observations. Um, I think we, a lot of us grew up with another schoolboy and schoolgirl logic, which was strict separation of church and state. And that America's First Amendment teaches that there must be a high and impregnable wall of separation between the religious and the secular, between religious or church uh, autonomy uh, and what the state does, and the two should be as separate as possible. And political life, the public square, um, laws, legislation, law, laws uh, by legislation or by judicial decision making had to be done free from any religious preferences, premises, uh, or preferences. Uh, we oftentimes, both in our domestic policy as well as in our foreign policy, took that as a given about how religion existed. It was the private hobby horse for uh, the superstitious and it was something interesting that they could do and they had freedom to do, but it couldn't have any effect upon public life. And we would suspect anybody that made religious arguments about legal and political matters, uh, and we would suspect any politician that would involve him or herself actively in a religious community. Um, that's given us a reflex about this, the purported secularity uh, and the neutrality uh, of law and government in general. And I think over the last 30 years, that's just flown very, very uh, uh, strongly into, into very strong headwinds of uh, of epistemology that have said, come on, this notion of neutrality really doesn't work anymore. Uh, everybody has basic founding assumptions, meta-ideals that they work with, and that some of them are religious, some of them are secular, but they're equally fervently held. Secondly, uh, we've come from that separation of church and state um, logic into an assumption that um, the state has omnicompetence over things like marriage, over things like family, education, charity. Uh, religious communities may want to do that themselves, but the state really has exclusive authority over this, and cooperation between the two shouldn't exist. And over the last 30 years, we've come to realize with the pervasiveness of the state's presence in society and the activity of religious communities in society that there are plenty of areas where they overlap. And so what the burden uh, going forward is, is to find the places of, of, of of overlapping consensus, of cooperation between the two, where they can get along and can serve each other rather than being in constant tension with each other. Whether that's a respect for the dignity of the other or the office of the other, uh, that's, I think, an aspiration, but I think it's pragmatically, at least, religious communities and political communities are going to have to figure out how to get along on some of the fundamentals, uh, both domestically and then increasingly internationally.
and marriage and family questions that we just talked about a few minutes ago, education questions, charity questions are areas where we're renegotiating those boundaries. And it's in this awkward business of faith-based initiatives and this, this funny business of religious legal systems dealing with marriage and family. That's the constant renegotiation about the boundary between public and private schools. Those are going to be perennially contested uh, zones of, of blurriness uh, that happily, I think, we have the, the mechanisms to, to continue to negotiate uh, day by day and, and, and over time. Um, but I think we're going to have to just get over the lie uh, that religion and law are hermetically and hermeneutically separate and that religious and political institutions can live in completely separate, indistinguishable spheres. The overlap is inevitable in finding the hermeneutic to allow them to interact responsibly, uh, maintaining the integrity of each side's responsibility in society, I think, is the goal. The, the, the tension here, it seems to be on the, on the one side, we, ha we can uh, have fanaticism uh, and prejudice emerging uh, from one or another uh, yeah. of the actors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, we th see things like humanitarianism, charity, you know, yeah. a fellowship for the other and so on. Is there a, 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 an ideal lever here? helping us to move yeah, down the right path to, to negotiate these, these contradictions uh, between uh, what can be the dark side of religion, you know, verse, you know, verse, you know which is a piece, yeah. but that, that is, is, is present in different places and different times. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the real uh, virtues and strength that, that are brought by religion to the law. Yeah, I think the uh, lever is being constructed as we speak and is being constructed case by case, issue by issue, area of competence and area of, by area of competence. I don't think there's a one size fits all for this. Secondly, I think it's increasingly obvious that the fundamentalists, political fundamentalists and religious fundamentalists who are utterly dogmatic about the certainty of their positions uh, simply can't play in this game and need to be excluded, and in that sense, the Constitution in the United States, through its Establishment Clause, provides, I think, very, very strong support that needs constantly to be there. Uh, I think, third, um, there, I think no new cooperation between religious and political communities can betray the fundamentals. Uh, the fundamentals of, of freedom of speech and press and assembly and association the fundamentals of equality uh, on racial, gender, culture, and other grounds that, that have been so uh, highly sought after. Uh, no cooperation, I think, can sacrifice due process and, and equal protection ideals more generally. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've learned, in part by trial and error, uh, is that as we think about bringing religious communities and political communities back into cooperation, we're going to have to make sure that we don't give up on those constitutional fundamentals. So in the faith-based initiative program, to give an example, where, where religious communities now can be amongst others to receive federal or state funding and deliver that to uh, the needy in society for whom the funding is directed, those religious communities can't discriminate on any ground, religious, gender, cultural, racial, or other ground in delivery of the services. They can't coerce a person to, as a condition for receiving the aid, participate in their religious worship service. Uh, they can't uh, use um, the, um, the, 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 the funds that have been directed to them by the federal or state government and divert them to the support for their religious worship or the collection of uh, you know, religious obligations and the like. There's a rather careful uh, bound set of boundary lines that have been set, which I think are, are healthy ones. The education area is another good example. Uh, yes, we can allow religious schools and public schools to sit side by side, uh, and that parties have a choice where they want to send their children, or if the children are becoming young adults, where they want to go. But there are certain fundamentals that are non-negotiable. They have to get basic reading, writing, arithmetic. They have to have basic physical education. There have to be basic facilities requirements for laboratories and gymnasia and libraries that are there. They have to have, they have to be prepared as democratic citizens. We cannot handicap them if they choose to go to a religious school. 
there too a, a religious freedom objection or an argument to say, but no, no, we, we want to cooperate only on our own terms by teaching them only Hebrew or Arabic or Dutch or Latin um, simply is not going to fly. Um, and there too, I think we have made the kind of pragmatic uh, adjustments, <laughs> the construction of at least one lever uh, to, to make this cooperation work. And those are hard things to construct, and, they're, and they're, it's a malleable instrument that's going to be renegotiated from time to time. I think it's worth constructing them so that religious and political communities can cooperate with the outsiders, the fundamentalist outsiders left out of that cooperative vehicle, and, and vigilant, vigilant, transparent uh, regulation to ensure that the areas of cooperation simply do not become stepping stones uh, for coercion or for betrayal of some of our fundamental constitutional ideals. Well, one final question. Uh, how would you advise students to prepare for the future where, whether they are religious or not, uh, religion will play an important part in, in kind of the, the, the public area? the public discourse. Yeah, I would go back to my um, argument a, a few minutes ago about the importance of learning to train your peripheral vision. Uh, even if you don't want to be focused on religious life or religious identity, you don't want to be part of a religious community, that's taboo for you. You've got your own faith, or you've got your own spiritualism, or you have no faith, or you have anti-faith. It's important as a learned member of society uh, to have just enough knowledge of those that have a different set of beliefs and practices to be able to understand what they're about, what drives them, what are their punch points, what are the things that you have to watch out for, uh, and what are the things within them that you have to respect. It's interesting, Mahatma Gandhi has this wonderful idea, uh, a community and an individual's uh, commitment to freedom is judged by how they treat their most hated minorities. And I like that idea. Uh, it's basically, a, and, and a learned citizen who's democratic and who believes in human rights values as a, mat, as, a, as a sine qua non for our existence of living together, has to be able to know enough to know how to, not to love the other, but not to hate the other. And I would say for a person growing up, um, it, to learn about different faith traditions, to, to wander into a, a temple or a synagogue or a mosque or a church and, and kind of feel what's there, to read a few of the key texts, to be aware of, of what's going on in society uh, so that you can be in learned conversation and you can advocate the position uh, that you take which happens to be of no faith or anti-faith. Uh, if you don't have the resources to understand the other, you can't argue convincingly uh, about the other. Well, on that note, John, uh, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, discussion. Thanks so much for having me. And it was a great pleasure to have you on our program. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.